it was the settings, turning on the speakers and the settings. There we go. That was the track. Well, if you're if you're not careful, we might make you a regular on here, and you're gonna have to do it all the time. <laughs> now that I've got now that I've got it sort of figured out. Well, well, we do need to do it more often. So uh, so then uh, I don't forget everything I've learned the last time. <laughs> <laughs> This episode of Bird in Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. The UPS Store franchise is your key to financial freedom, being your own boss, and having complete control of your time. Learn more about having your own top-ranked franchise that offers the stability of a world-renowned brand and business model by visiting theupsstorefranchising.com slash bourbon. Art Eatables, the world's first bourbon certified chocolatier and creator of the small batch bourbon truffle. These aren't your grandma's bourbon balls. Shop through two locations in downtown Louisville or online at arteatables.com. Use offer code PURSUIT to save 5% on your in-store and online orders. Everyone, the bourbon releases are making their way out. Camping lines are starting to form. Markets are going crazy. How much more of this can we take? Well, our guest today will tell us how we got here and what we can expect for the future. There are all kinds of opinions on the future of bourbon. So actually, I want to hear your answers. Share with us on Facebook and Twitter because we're going to take those and we might talk about them on the next roundtable segment if we get enough participation from everybody. I have to say thank you to everyone that has submitted an iTunes review because we have eclipsed the 100th review mark. I mean, that's just awesome, and it really does mean a lot to have these reviews. It's great feedback for us because it helps us adapt and continue on, and we know we're doing great things, but it also helps others looking for bourbon podcasts to find this one more easily. We've been told on many occasions that the format of our podcast cuts through a lot of that meaningless chit-chat and gets straight to the topic at hand. When we started this podcast, I knew I only wanted to put out content that I would want to listen to myself, so we're going to continue kicking butt right here for you all. With that said, we now have advertisement slots open, and those are going to start filling for 2018, so reach out to us at the duo, T-H-E-D-U-O, at bourbonpursuit.com to start locking in some dates for our future shows. And to kick it off, enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast, the official podcast of bourbon. Today is something that we have a, a subject that was done through our Russell's Reserve giveaway when people asked or people said, uh, I want to know, is the bubble going to pop? Why? How are we here? How did we get here? What's the future of bourbon at this point? Uh, we've talked about on the roundtable before when you know master distillers have said, uh, the greatest bourbon has yet to be made, and yet we've got gimmicks like, uh, you know, bourbon that's being sent off on the space shuttles to be space aged, and uh, you know, you name any kind of other kind of gimmick that's happening right now. So there's a there is a a lot of experimentation. Whether it's the future of it, who knows? But maybe our our guest today can be able to shed a little bit of light. Ryan's not here today, but this is being done on YouTube Live. We've got uh, a few different viewers that are on here, and they may be sending some questions in as well. Uh, these are all people that have been supporting us on Patreon, and so they have the private access link to be able to watch this happening live as well. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce a man who has uh, been a guest on the show before. It was back on episode 80. We had uh, him come on, talk about his history. Uh, he's authored many books. Uh, we also had him come on and we talked about the time when Beam was backpedaling after they said, oh, we're going to raise the price on bookers. And they said, oh, that's not a really good idea. So we talked about that for a little bit, a uh, little, little bit as well. So we have on today, we have Chuck Cowdery is a name that is very well known with inside of the, the bourbon realm. Um, he's part of, uh, you know, he, as I said, he's written uh, lots of books. Uh, he's been adorned with uh, I don't know. Maybe it's maybe he's maybe I know he's, I saw a, a Facebook post on him uh, a few weeks ago. He says you haven't really made it into bourbon until you get a gold medal or has one of those medallions. So I don't know if he's got a medallion yet, but he is he is a household name for bourbon. So Chuck, welcome back to the show. 
Actually, a friend of mine reminded me I do actually have a couple of medallions that I uh, won in a competition about 10 years ago. So I, uh, I, should, I, I should go put them on. Maybe next time I'll put on all my, uh, all my regalia. <laughs> all your all your all your whiskey bling is that what well, you want to call it? It also identifies me as a member of the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame, and I have my uh, uh, trophy for that, which is actually a small still. So I should uh, I should set up the you know studio with all that stuff all that stuff behind me. Sorry, <laughs> it's, uh, as as anybody who's watching this can tell, I can't even be bothered to light the room, let alone. Uh, <laughs> Let alone decorate it. Um, uh, I am going to, uh, to talk about bourbon pretty much any time. Well, before we, we get going, I want to let people uh, let you uh, plug yourself real quick, uh, a quick brief history of who you are and some of the books that you've published as well. Yeah, um, my name is Chuck Cowdery. Uh, if you, probably the easiest way to find me is just Google the name, C O W D E R Y. Um, I've written several books. The first one, uh, probably the best known one, was Bourbon Straight, which came out in 2004. So kind of at the beginning of all this craziness. Um, I publish a newsletter, been publishing that for uh, more than 20 years. It's called The Bourbon Country Reader. Just a very small, very personal sort of thing, but it's probably the on paper uh, equivalent of doing a podcast. <laughs> um, you know, uh, staying sort of in that in that traditional mode. I started out working in the industry and in the marketing uh, side of it. That was what got me kind of interested in it. I lived in Kentucky at that time. I live in Chicago now. And so really just uh, caught the bug um, back when it certainly didn't look like it was going to be worth anything, which was uh, back in the, uh, uh, well, starting in the late 70s, uh, really got into it more in, in, in the 80s. And then uh, the real sort of tipping point was in 91, 92, when I produced uh, the documentary Made and Bottled in Kentucky for public television. And that was pretty much uh, uh, when I really caught, caught I'd, I'd had uh, a few bouts of the disease before that, but that was when I really caught a full on dose of it and uh, really have just been sort of obsessed with uh, with bourbon and the industry and the history and all the rest of it ever since. So in my opinion, there's there's no better person to kind of talk about uh, this than you, right? It's not like you've been inside of a, a, a distillery and watched it change. You know, you've been on the outside watching it happen and you've seen the effects uh, that have been you know, push towards it as well. So the the reason why I'd asked Chuck to come on the show again is because he had given a presentation at the New Orleans Bourbon uh, Festival and kind of talked about, you know, what's the state of the industry right now? And that's kind of what I, I want to go in. And he had actually sent me an article earlier uh, that he had written in one of his publications that that kind of talked about the the past, present, and the future of bourbon. And so we're going to kind of use that as a, as a guide of, of of the discussion here and kind of, you know, where we're going to talk about. And of course, we're going to start about the past. So Chuck, I'm going to, I'm going to put it to you first. Uh, you know, when I talk about the past uh, with bourbon, you know, was it an all over, was it ever an understanding at some point that bourbon could possibly become extinct because people just weren't drinking it anymore? Well, yeah, I mean, to go way back, let's, let's not go all the way back, but let's say starting at the repeal of prohibition, obviously when prohibition was repealed in 33, um, people wanted to drink and they wanted to drink uh, bourbon. They wanted to drink American whiskey, bourbon and rye. Uh, that's what they had drunk before uh, prohibition. And, and basically if you were living in the United States and you drank a distilled spirit, the distilled spirit you drank was American whiskey, either bourbon or rye or corn whiskey. but. Uh, bourbon and rye primarily, and there was very little in the way of imports, um, even from Canada at that time. So that's what people drank. So after prohibition, they figured that's what people wanted to drink again. So the industry geared up. And in fact, yes, sales uh, uh, demand outpaced supply year after year after year. Um, and uh, then the war, of course, came and, and 
and a lot of distilleries were converted into uh, straight alcohol production for the war effort. So the suburban kind of took a hit. Uh, it was still being made and still being sold. It was certainly still legal during the war, but it was in short supply. And so again, there was that you know that that tightness in the market, a lot more demand than there was supply. End of the war, uh, again, the distilleries are sort of gearing up, being built up as fast as they can, and still um, more demand than, than supply. You know, pressure on, on supplies, people aren't able to, there's just not as much bourbon as people want. So the distilleries keep expanding, keep making more, then really suddenly, and, and you know, and, this and is before industry. we jump into that, I mean, one, one question that I kind of had, and maybe it's rumor, but, you know, I've heard like, you know, even during that time of the effort and even the, the resurgence at that time, people were actually drinking more whiskey then than they are even now today. Well, ultimately, yeah. I mean, at the peak of the industry, when you get into the 60s and, and, uh, and times are good, everybody's got money, uh, supplies are starting to catch up with demand. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, of course, the population was larger. It was much more acceptable for women to drink publicly and uh, and in the home uh, than it had been before prohibition. Um, that was sort of one of the big changes that came as a result of prohibition. Was the uh, you know before prohibition, it was really almost. I, I hate. I can't say it was almost all men who drank, but certainly uh, saloons, uh, drinking in public in bars and in saloons, that was a male preserve. And the uh, women who were in those bars were, uh, they're in a professional capacity. Um, it wasn't a place where a respectable woman would go and have a drink. It just wasn't done. And actually prohibition, the speakeasies changed that because suddenly it was fashionable to uh, go to a speakeasy and have a cocktail, and uh, women participated in that uh, in that adventure as much as men did. And then after prohibition, um, it really kind of the, the the attitude really stayed that the way, and it became much more acceptable. So, so yes, um, there was there was a lot more alcohol in general being consumed, and still most of it was American-made whiskey. Uh, it was either straight whiskey or blended whiskey, and blended whiskey was a bigger part of the mix than it is now, in part because there was so little aged whiskey, they used neutral spirit and so forth, and flavoring and coloring to stretch it out. And that, that but, but overall, yes, I mean, it, it was, Vixky was very popular, and and they weren't making enough of it. I mean, they were making as much as they could, but they kept needing more and more. So they kept expanding and expanding and expanding. And then really, you know, even if you didn't live through it, everybody, you know, this is the the uh, anniversary of the Summer of Love of, of 1967, um, San Francisco. And things, it was a crazy time. I was still in high school then, but still it was a crazy time uh, in terms of, attitudes and, and changes and uh, changes in the culture and changes in people's behavior. Uh, suddenly there were, um, let's just say, non-liquid intoxicants uh, that were becoming very popular and just all sorts of things like that. And so suddenly in the late 60s, it depends on, on what you're counting, if, if you want to put an exact year on it, but late 60s, very early 70s, suddenly the bottom just fell out of the of the bourbon market it um it just people were drinking other things suddenly people were smoking other things just doing other things and and bourbon and whiskey in general and certainly bourbon i uh, had gotten this reputation as being what your you know parents drank what what the old people drank if you were young you know that wasn't what you were interested in um Certainly in that generation, uh, people were still drinking a lot of beer. They were drinking wine. They were drinking, you know, pop wines like uh, Boone's Farm and things like that. They were drinking tequila. They were drinking rum. Um, I'll be honest. This is the first time I've ever heard anybody attribute illegal drugs to the demise of bourbon as well. 
Well, I mean, that's, you know, it, it, uh, it let's just say it was a, it was a time of a lot of change. And, um, but one of those changes was people did stop buying bourbon in droves. So here you had a, 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 an industry that had been gearing up, gearing up, gearing up, expanding, 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 producing as much as it could. And of course, with the aging cycle, that means that they were always producing ahead of when the whiskey was going to be available for sale. So when the, the bottom fell out in the late 60s, you know, they had whiskey in warehouses that was anticipating an expanded market, you know, four, five, six, seven years out. And in fact, the market was contracting. So you not only had, you know, it's not like, say, with the automobile industry, if sales suddenly slumped, you just stop making cars for a while and 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 equalize that. But with bourbon, because that whiskey's in the warehouses and it's aging, you can't stop you, know, you can't stop it aging. Um, you you find yourself when when you have that sudden sales collapse like that, uh, you find yourself with a stock that's actually not going not being taken away. That's actually growing even though you're not selling anything. So that's exactly what happened. And because it was so unexpected, because it happened on the heels of 20 years, 30 years of uninterrupted growth, the producers were in denial about it. They couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that was happening. And so they did keep producing. They, they kept thinking, this is just a blip. These are crazy times, you know, in, in a, you know six months, in a year. Uh, sales are going to come back and we don't want to be caught without enough product. So they kept producing and kept producing and kept producing well into the seventies, even though it was becoming more and more apparent that the uh, sales were not coming back. We're not rebounding. And in fact, we're, we're continuing to climb and, and really between the, the peak and the nadir, um, the industry lost half of its volume. You know, half as much whiskey was being sold through the at the end of that period as was being sold at the beginning of that period. And, and as you mentioned before, we're still, even with the growth in the last few years, we're still not back to, I think the peak year um, for production was 67, something like that. maybe that was the peak year for, for sales. Uh, for depletions, but at any rate, we're not back to those. We're not quite back to those levels yet, although we're we're pretty close, and and uh, right. uh, probably will be back there pretty soon. But at any rate, uh, so that was that happened, and it didn't come back, and it didn't come back, and it stayed. It's it it finally hit a bottom and stayed at that bottom for rather a long time, all through the seventies, well into the eighties. And during really this time, yeah. I mean, during the '70s and '80s, when it's in this lull period, I mean, what are what are distillers doing at this time? I mean, is it this time, as you had mentioned, like they're they're ramping down production, or they're layoffs? And other things, they're diversifying. Um, they're acquiring uh, companies that make um, other kinds of distilled spirits. So yeah, suddenly anybody who was just in the bourbon business was in trouble. Uh, so they were selling. They were either selling out or closing down. And so you know, by the end of the period, you had almost everybody with a pretty diversified portfolio. And that was still going on. I was talking to some Jim Beam people last night and telling them when I first got involved with Jim Beam was in 1987, 88, right after they had purchased national distillers. And Beam went more or less overnight from being a one brand company to being a full portfolio company. And Beam had actually been one of the, the brands that had not done too badly during all this. Uh, Jim Beam had done okay. Uh, Jack Daniels had done okay. I mean, the, the names, the old names that we still have with us are the ones that you know came through that period pretty well. Um, old Crow was the brand probably that took the biggest hit. Uh, they were losing market share at double digit rates. I mean, by handfuls every year for quite a few years in that period, they had gone from being 
you know, the number one bourbon to being basically nothing. Um, and is that so, just because of better advertising or is it because well, of just you know, it, it, no, it, yeah, and I was involved in marketing the business and, it, at that time and there were uh, endless discussions, people trying to figure out why. And, you know, they, they, they came up, I mean, the, the theories kind of sound silly now, but they were the best we could come up with. Uh, any brand that had the word old in its name, which had been a, considered a good thing, um, especially in the post-prohibition period when there was not very much old whiskey and a lot of the distilleries, almost all the distilleries were brand new, it became very fashionable to have old in the name. Um, well, when this change happened, when the, the 60s happened, suddenly old was the last thing you wanted to be. So the brands that had the word old in their name were the ones that seemed to be taking the biggest hit. And the brands that were a man's name, a square bottle, <laughs> you know, those things. I mean, that, that was as much as we could figure out was that if it was a man's name and it was a square bottle, for some reason that seemed to that seemed to, to be good. So that described both Jim Beam and Jack Daniels. Jim Beam hadn't copied Jack Daniels or vice versa. They just both happened to be brands that were a man's name and a real person's name at that. Mm -hmm. and there was also oh, what so Evan Williams at that time, time too, right? Hmm? So There's also Evan Williams around that time too, well, right? I was just gonna say, then you got the clones, which were Evan Williams and Ezra Brooks and a dozen others, but those are the two that are still around today. Uh, and of course, Evan Williams, um, and I had some involvement with Heaven Hill during that period, uh, which makes Evan Williams. Evan Williams uh, started out as a Jack Daniels clone, but I think their success was based on offering a very good whiskey at a very good price. I mean, that may sound, you know, to the cynic, that may sound like, well, that can't be what worked, just offering a good product and a good price, you know. Yeah, it's always what? Bigger, faster, cheaper, choose any, choose any two, right? Then that's that the exactly way. What Heaven Hill did, and they advertised it relentlessly but very inexpensively small space ads and so forth and in that they kind of copied uh jack daniels but um and, and uh, you know they and they they stuck to their knitting i mean they they had a, a a strategy and they stuck to it and ultimately it was very successful and to this day uh evan williams is is number three behind Jack Daniels and Jim Beam, but but the third largest selling American straight whiskey. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's not talk doing as much as in, in export as Beam and 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 uh, Daniels are, but still, Evan Williams is is a really great success story and um, and an example of doing it the right way too. I mean, it wasn't built on a lot of hokum; it was built on a good product for a good price and good availability and all the rest of it. So at any rate, that, that was the sort of the state of the industry at the time. Uh, early times, which I was involved with, they didn't uh, change to a man's name, but they did change to a square bottle. They had a round bottle and, uh, and went to, and they, they'd had a very, very colorful, bright uh, red and orange label that they toned down quite a bit into so pretty similar to what it is now muted uh beiges and so forth but going with more of a of a look like say a jack daniels or an evan williams model or even a jim beam bottle a much less garish looking label and they and they were um number three at that time they they were ahead of evan williams evan williams has since passed them but um and so that, yeah it, it it sounds almost silly but that was the kind of the ways people were thinking uh, they certainly were not thinking they were they were there was a, a you know, trying to manage a decline profitably and yes it, at about that time let's say uh, the mid 80s 84 85 uh, was when people were starting to talk I, I i did a lot of work with brown foreman and one of the accounts that i worked on for them was noily Prant vermouth which was a product they didn't own but they sold in the u.s 
and I had been asked to come up with some ideas for them. And basically the brand manager, uh, after I made my presentation said, um, good ideas, wrong brand. And he said, you know, the, vermouth is a dying category. So we're not going to build up vermouth sales. Our attitude with vermouth is let's try to make money off it as, as the sales decline. Uh, and, and bourbon was not much different than that. They were just trying, that was why early times became a Kentucky whiskey because uh, by using some used barrels, they could cut a little bit of the cost and they were struggling to make any kind of a profit on these products because um, everybody was cutting prices because they had more whiskey than they could sell. Nobody was really in the market for a premium product. Uh, when I would hear that in meetings, I would say, what about Maker's Mark, which I was living in Kentucky at the time, and Maker's Mark was starting to make a little bit of noise. And I would say, what about Maker's Mark? And I would, the answer I would get back was, well, that's just a couple of rich guys screwing around. That's not a real brand. Um, that's an interesting take. Yeah, Bill loves that story. Uh, <laughs> but that was the way, that was the way the rest of the industry uh, viewed Maker's Mark, and they really viewed the industry as something that, uh, you know, the, the drinkers of bourbon were old, they were going to die, um, no young people were picking it up, except in the South. I mean, the South, the, you know, the, the states of the old Confederacy continued to be loyal to bourbon, and so uh, bourbon continued, to, of course, those are not the states either, so um, they, they weren't necessarily uh, you know, paying all the bills, but uh, still, they, they, you know, they, there was, uh, you know, were young consumers uh, in, in Kentucky and Tennessee and Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia and the Carolinas and uh, Texas, of course, being a large state that also uh, continued to, uh, to, to be bourbon drinkers. And, and Texas, interestingly enough, was and is um, the most popular state for wheated bourbon. Um, mm -hmm. W.L. Weller especially uh, has always been very, very successful in, in Texas. And that was even true back in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s and, and 80s, uh, you know, during that old period when it was still, uh, still Stitzel Weller owned by the, owned by the Van Winkle family. So yeah, that's that's sort of what the, what the state of things was, and then in the late '80s was when um, bourbon started to get popular in Japan, and it was kind of the reverse of what had happened in the United States. In the United States, everybody drank bourbon, and then the young people said, "We don't want to do what our parents did," and so the young people stopped drinking bourbon. In Japan. Uh, same sort of thing happened. It happened a little later, and the thing that their parents did that they didn't want to do anymore was drink scotch, and and the Japanese whiskeys that were very scotch-like. Um, so the young consumers said, we don't want to do what our parents do. We want to do something else, and they started drinking bourbon and became, uh, became bourbon fans, and actually I.W. Harper became the the best selling uh, best selling bourbon in um, in Japan and really kind of started the whole I mean you think that was based because of the uh, you know the decanter the guy the top hat do you think it kind of had some uh, marketing actually, aspect to it? it was actually not so much an image as it was just um, the, the company had a good organization and a good a good Japanese partner and so that when um, when Japanese consumers began to be interested in, in bourbon. They were the ones who were best positioned to exploit that interest. So I don't think, you know, I mean, I think Harper had an image certainly that was American, which was part of what those consumers were looking for. Uh, but I don't know that it was necessarily the, you know, the top hat and, and right. the, you know, that image actually in a lot of ways was seemed to be um, borrowed from Johnny Walker, it was very similar to The Walking Man. Uh, it's very possible that the Japanese consumers, they didn't want to drink scotch, but they were comfortable with that kind of imagery for a whiskey. 
and uh, and and so I W Harper kind of kind of clicked for them. It's it's hard to tell, but I know I you know I, that that's a little before my time. So most of what I know about that is from you know, reading newspaper articles at the time and so forth. I mean, was bourbon more or less seen like a like a premium spirit at that time, where you oh, no, 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 you were rich or something or Bourbon was very much a commodity. Bourbon was uh, shot in a beer. I mean, it was. Uh, uh, I'm talking like in Japan, like. Oh, in Japan, no. Yes, in Japan, it was an export. It was, or uh, you know, import rather. Uh, it was. It was an import. Uh, the Japanese, especially the younger Japanese, were becoming interested in American fashion and American art and American music, American movies. So it, it stood to reason that they would be interested in uh, American booze. And yes, and it was considered it was it was one of the reasons that um, well, Shenley, what what's now Diageo, took I W Harper off the market in the U S. Really, only introduced it back into the U S. about two years ago. And the reason they took it off the market in the U S. was because it was it was cheap bottom shelf whiskey in the U S. and it was an expensive import in Japan. And so what clever entrepreneurial Americans were doing was buying it at yeah, wholesale, buying legitimate product uh, that they were buying at wholesale. And uh, instead of ship selling it at retail, like they were in the US, like they were supposed to do, they were shipping it to Japan. And the, the pricing difference was, was so great that if they could, that even paying, paying wholesale prices in the US, they could, make money uh, in Japan, that product make good money. That's called gray market. And it's not quite black market because it's all legal product, but it's going through an illegal or at least unsanctioned distribution channel. And so that's why um, um, that's so why took it off the market in the US. Another question is, you know, during this time, what were distilleries doing in regards of, you know, since you have a background in marketing, what are they doing in regards of marketing for these Japanese and European markets? Because if the market wasn't there for the U.S. and they saw as exports as being the biggest benefactor for their survival, what were they doing differently? Well, the, the you know, the, the thing about in Japan, and it's still true in Japan, if you want to do business in Japan, and this is true in most countries, but it's certainly maybe even more true in Asia. You need a local partner. You need a, a company that's in the beverage business if you're selling a beverage product and knows how to market to those consumers. So um, the American companies didn't do very much except tell their Japanese partners, uh, you know, to do what they thought was best in terms of marketing. But what they did was market it very much as an American product with all the imagery that you would expect having to do with America. And then when it started to uh, grow in Europe, uh, the, the same thing. So I, I recall a, a Jim Beam ad that was may have run in Japan. I know, I know it ran in, in uh, Western Europe and it basically depicted a cowboy, um, you know, cowboy hat, blue jeans, but riding a motorcycle and, you know, in, in a desert sort of environment. And, you know, that was sort of the modern American cowboy image. Um, and, and you saw a lot of variations on that and still do. Um, and, you know, it was one of the reasons that, that uh, again, the predecessor company to Diageo uh, thought that they could do very well with Rebel Yell in the, in the, uh, in the foreign market, market right. in Europe, because they thought, well, it's you know a connection to American history and so forth. I think maybe hanging it on the Confederacy maybe didn't have the the resonance that they that they hoped it would. Um, the, the imagery that the rest of the world seems to like about about America is the cowboy thing. I mean that that's really at the top of the heap. Anything having to do with 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 the old West and cowboys and and the cowboy look and so forth, not necessarily, you know, fighting Indians or anything like that, but, uh, um, you know, just the, the, the American individual, the wide open spaces, uh, you know, the thing that was 
taking the world by storm at that time uh, was blue jeans, uh, Levi's. You know, that was that was the American export that was that young people in virtually every country in the world was excited about. That was what everybody wanted to wear was Levi's. And obviously it was very good for Levi's, but the, the that connection to that image of America and Americana, um, and certainly music was was a part of it too. Um, country and Western music, for example, had always been very popular in um, in England, in uh, you know Germany to some extent. Uh, Jim Beam got a lot of benefit in uh, Germany because that was the main brand distributed to U.S. troops who were stationed there you know, after the war. And so during the, the you know, post-war period, when there were still a lot of American troops in, in Germany and in, in France and throughout Europe, um, a lot of what they drank was... Uh, a lot of what they had available to drink was Jim Beam, and so that continued and, and, and sort of paved the way for Jim Beam when they um, when they began to reestablish that. And of course, the biggest selling brand internationally is Jack Daniels, and all the sort of Americana imagery connected with Jack Daniels seems to be something that um, that people really. I mean, again, it's not just you know Jack himself and the kind of Southern gentleman uh, outlook and, and so forth. But it's, it's the modern stuff too. the connection to motorcycles keeps, keeps cropping right. up. You know, no, I got you. I got you. Motorcycle gangs and, and those uh, uh, somewhat sanitized versions of, of those images. Um, so, so exports had a, had a pretty good impact on, you know, the resurgence of bourbon. There's also something that, that I also saw that you, you talked about in saying that, you know, some of the resurgence that we see is, is partly because of the lack of drinkers that we had at one time, because there was the unintentional benefit that now there's actually very well-aged whiskey that's just kind of sitting around. Yeah, that was a, I mean, that was part of what brought it back to the U.S. and that, that even, well, you know, the, the Japanese thing in the in the late 80s was what prompted the introduction of products like Blanton's and then ultimately Booker's. And those things came out in the, I remember Booker's coming out in, I think it was 89. I know I actually had my first glass of Booker's in Louisville. So I know uh, I wasn't still living there then, but I was, I was spending, still spending a lot of time there. And it, uh, so, so they started introducing these new products, and yes, uh, a lot of it. What did have to do with age? The Japanese, uh, because the, of their their Scotch drinking ways, uh, were certainly used to seeing age statements of twelve years old and eighteen years old, and uh, they began to ask their suppliers, their American suppliers, "Do you have any bourbon that's?" 12 years old, 18 years old. And ordinarily, the, the answer would be no. And ordinarily, the answer would be, oh, my God, no. Because uh, at least the American producers and Americans in general uh, at that time didn't think very much of, 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 of very, very old bourbon. In fact, you could rarely find anything older than about 12 years on, on the market. And that was even uh, very rare to, to find. Um, Almost all bourbon was being sold in the four to six year old age range. So when the but when the Japanese said that, all of a sudden they said, "Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, we do. We didn't mean to, but because of all that, what we call the the glut period, or, or I call it the pig in the python, uh, it just kept sort of moving, you know, moving through um, uh, this whiskey that had been made and wasn't being sold, and just kept getting older and older." So yeah, then what happened was as we started to get into the 90s uh, and, and this, you know, the Japanese were more and more interested in this older whiskey, again, into entrepreneurs um, like, like a, a guy named Gordon Hugh who lived in, uh, in Covington, Kentucky, just across the river from Cincinnati and owned a liquor store called Cork and Bottle. He got the idea to 
start checking into these distilleries and find out who had, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 year old whiskey to sell, found a few. One of them he found was in Pennsylvania, a place called Michter's, and they had some 16 year old bourbon that uh, they had available to sell because the, the person who had, it had been contract made and the person who made it owned it, didn't really have any use for it. And so they contacted him and he was a guy by the name of Adolf Hirsch. And, um, and he gave them permission. He not only sold them the whiskey, but gave him permission to use his name. And that's how A.H. Hirsch, uh, bourbon became came into existence it was originally created for the japanese market and was sold a, a lot of it especially in the early days sold in japan uh, but they did sell some of it at their liquor store at cork and bottle and at some other liquor stores and it began to create a following in the u.s and, and that was wasn't just Hirsch, there were others, but that's probably the name that people know. And that is what uh, really started this trend of people being interested in these very, very old whiskeys. It's a pretty good tidbit right there. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I happen to have written a whole book about it. Yes, you have. It's called The Best Bourbon You'll Never Taste, which is available uh, at my uh, at my blog. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, which I assume you'll provide a link to. <laughs> of course, of course. And uh, uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, that's the story there. But that was really the beginning of it. And there were many others. And, and Hugh did others. Uh, Julian Van Winkle was the bottler for her. She didn't own the brand or have any, any commercial interest in it other than as the bottler. But he obviously saw what was going on and, uh, and came out and, and continued the brand that is father had started, really his grandfather had started, which was the Van Winkle brand. But he he really um, established the idea that the Van Winkle brand would represent very well-aged whiskey. So the youngest brand in their, youngest product in their portfolio was a 10-year-old, and then they had a 15-year-old, and then they, and they, they went along like that for a while on a 12-year-old rye, but then they added a 20 year old bourbon and a 23 year old bourbon. And those are the, the pappy uh, that are so, the pappies that are so hard to get uh, today. That's pretty much how they start. So they started in direct response to the, the Japanese trend, although they were created more for the American market, although they were certainly sold in Japan. And, and, and you know, against, I mean, no less a figure than Booker No. Um, said that the best bourbons were between six and eight years old. Uh, most distillers that I've talked to uh, over the years, especially the older ones, uh, would agree with that. Some of them um, would say 10 years is good. Some of them would say 12 years is good. Uh, some of them would say nothing older than eight years is good. I mean, everybody had their own, had their own uh, attitudes about it. Um, some of the best bourbon ever made, though, was some of the weeded bourbon that Stitzel Weller made that uh, was aged 10, 12 years. Um, yeah, and so I kind of want to talk about that just a little bit because, I mean, that was sort of a an adverse effect of this era, right, in, in regards of, you know, having so much stock and then realizing that the bottom has kind of fallen out and they just had to kind of sell everything out and kind of shut doors, right? Well, Stitzel Weller had sold... 10 year old and 12 year old, even, even in the fifties when it was, uh, when there was plenty of demand, but they just, that was just something, that was just what they did. I mean, they, you know, Pappy Van Winkle, um, you know, definitely did position old Fitzgerald and, and W.L. Weller as uh, premium products. Um, and, and, and so they did offer those 10, but then those, they became much more, um, uh, prominent in the, in the mix when uh, they had so much extra whiskey. I mean, they, they obviously, when they had a lot of 10 and 12 year old, they put a lot more emphasis on the, the 20, 10 and 12 year old products. And those were still, I mean, the, the very, very old Fitzgerald at 12 years old was, um, 
you know, still available, though becoming harder and harder to find in uh, the early 90s. And a lot of that was sent to Japan, but uh, a lot of it did, did stay in the, in the U.S. But yeah, that was just another example of it. So, you know, right now we're, we're talking about, you know, there's a there's a surge in the buying uh, between, you know, domestically and internationally and stuff like that. Uh, and you, you kind of talk about there's also a, a surge of NDPs at this time or what you've coined as non non distilling producers. So kind of talk about what they were doing at this time uh, as as production was ramping up at some of these distilleries as well. Well, of course, that's what. That's what uh, Van Winkle was. That's what, uh, and still is, you know, to the extent that they're separate from Buffalo Trace. Buffalo Trace is the is the distillery, but Van Winkle is a semi-separate company still. But in those days, um, they were strictly an NDP. Although every almost everything they were selling was from the old family distillery from Stitzel Weller. Um, and Hugh, the same way, the Hirsch stuff, obviously, was sourced whiskey. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of extra aged uh, products, these very old products, the, the distilleries weren't interested in them. So if they could sell off those 19, 20-year-old barrels, uh, they were happy to sell them and happy to sell them pretty cheap. I mean, especially in comparison to what you would pay for something like that now. They were relatively cheap. So an entrepreneur, not even somebody who actually had an established liquor company, could get the necessary, you know, with a relatively small investment, could get the necessary licenses, could get the, the stock because it was very available and, and very inexpensive, and get some bottles and have some labels printed and find a distributor and get out there into the marketplace with... Um, you know, with the products that were often very small. I mean, you know, the Willet products uh, have become very popular, and 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 they had a lot of bottlings over over the years uh, in in those very old uh, products. But you know, I'd get them. They they would give me the the sort of the statistics on some of these products, and they they would have you know. 80 cases, they produce 80 cases of this thing and 40 cases of this other thing. I mean, they were very small runs. And even Van, even even the Hirsch um, was being produced in runs of, you know, 200 cases here, 150 cases there. I mean, just whatever they could sell, they would, they had the whiskey by then in tanks. They didn't have it in barrels anymore. And, you know, they would make a sale and they would bottle up as much as, as they needed for that sale. And it would be relatively small numbers. I think, um, you know, 400 cases was maybe the, the, the most at any one time. Actually, the Berghoff, uh, which is a bar restaurant here in Chicago, was uh, Van Winkle's biggest customer. And, uh, uh, and they, they sold a, a, a Berghoff-branded you know, house branded bourbon, but it was Van Winkle bourbon, and uh, that was that was Julian's biggest biggest customer for the for the Van Winkle stuff, and it was, you know, maybe a thousand cases a year, and that was his biggest customer. So it was it was not big numbers, but it was it was going to people who were very enthusiastic about it, and if you think about the timing, especially as you get further into the into the nineties say past the mid 90s you start to get the internet uh you start to get i mean the first um sort of bourbon discussion group or whiskey discussion group that i got involved in was on the prodigy service uh, which was a, 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 a online service that sears set up and it was you know these these were people with 20 you know 1200 baud 2400 baud modems um with very, very crude, um, you know, screen. That wasn't even really the, the World Wide Web yet. It was still, it was the internet, but it was really pre, pre-World pre Wide Web. So you really didn't have the, the graphical user interfaces that the, that the web made possible. And, but it was the very beginning of this stuff. And, and, and Prodigy had a, 
a wine, actually a wine board, bulletin board type of format. And, but they had, you know, different sections, different channels in it. And some people had started a, a whiskey discussion channel and, and beer and other things too. And that was the first thing that I got involved with. And then it kind of moved over to CompuServe, which was another uh, service of that, of that sort at the same time. And then the World Wide Web hit. And then in 1999, um, uh, something called straightbourbon.com came on, came online. And I was involved with it from the beginning. I was never like an owner or, or even an administrator, but I, I was a member of it from the, from the beginning. And it was set up, it was not a for-profit operation. It was basically set up by an IT guy who um, worked for a company, worked for a company actually owned by his brother. And they were, they did basically IT work for the defense department but he was a bourbon enthusiast the brother was and so he he programmed this thing and set this thing up and it's still probably the other than the bourbon groups say on facebook or twitter things like that but as far as a standalone um bourbon group it's still a pretty significant one um, right so you know, that's a you know that's so a that big... was a really important but the internet was a really important part of how things got going um in the late 90s Absolutely. Uh, and that's what I kind of want to kind of, you know, uh, move forward to this and kind of to where we are in present day. Right. So, uh, you know, at this point, you know, in the 90s, uh, there was probably a turn, I would say, probably around like 2013, 2012, 2010 is kind of when a, a lot of stuff really started uh, amping up for um, a lot of people. Right. I mean, is that about the same time that you've seen as well? What happened, and it's one of those things that nobody can seem to explain, is that starting in the in the late 80s, things just started getting better a little bit, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. And so every year it got a little bit better. Um, but, but it was growing at, you know, maybe let's say 4 or 5%. Um, it, it sort of picked up a little bit of steam right around the turn of the century, right around 2000, 2001, it started growing a little bit more. And then at about the time you're talking about uh, six, seven years ago, it just suddenly went into a different gear. It just went into this high gear and nobody could really explain why, except just to say, well, maybe it just hit a critical mass that all these things were happening and sort of bubbling up slowly. And then suddenly, you know, how a pot uh, will, will maybe steam a little bit, but suddenly start boiling. And it was, it was that kind of a phenomenon where it just got to the point where everything fell into place. And, you know, because of the aging cycle, bourbon producers are very careful about predicting future sales. Uh, they don't want to underproduce. They don't want to overproduce. They really work very hard to try to get it just right. And it was about that time um, that you're talking about when they all pretty much said, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. Uh, everybody just suddenly kind of threw their forecasting out the window and said, we need to produce as much as we can. And they figured out what their distilleries were capable of in their present configuration and maxed that out and then started figuring out the most economical ways to expand. And in many cases, that didn't necessarily mean a new uh, a new or a larger still that maybe meant more fermenters. That maybe just meant going to to two shifts rather than one, or going to three shifts rather than two, or uh, producing further into the summer. Uh, I was just looking at some stuff from 1910, and 1910, you know, was still enough before prohibition that the industry was still going pretty strong, but still a lot of distilleries we're only operating maybe six months out of the year. Um, in a, the, the highest days of summer, warmest days of summer, July, August, um, you know, into, into early September, it was just too hot, you know, and they would shut down because they didn't have air conditioning. Um, they had usually had uh, spring water that was cold that they could cool down the fermenters with and so forth. Uh, 
but they didn't have chillers. They didn't have like we have now and so forth. So it would just get too hot in the summer. So they would close down for a couple months in the summer. And they would usually close down for a couple months in the, in the winter to do maintenance and so forth. Heck, I mean, probably back in, in 1910, in that period, it was still very seasonal. So that uh, uh, I know one thing that had always been true in distilleries was that a lot of the hands were farmers and they wouldn't work during planting season and they wouldn't work during harvest season. Uh, so you had to schedule uh, distillery production around around that. Also, of course, uh, um, very dependent on, uh, on, on the grain supplies. So uh, obviously fall after the fall harvest would usually be the end of the year in terms of in terms mm -hmm. of actual distilling activities. Now, a lot of that stuff, I mean, Heaven Hill was one of the first distillery that pretty much routinely operated year round. Uh, if they shut down, it was it would be for, you know, maybe two weeks um, because you just had to from, you know, time to time for maintenance. And they didn't uh, necessarily run 24 hours a day like, like a lot of them do. They would run, um, like just a normal day shift, like maybe 10 hours a day, six days a week, that kind of thing. But they, but they would run all year. And, uh, yeah. And, you know, to this day, they still do maintenance and stuff like that. But I, I kind of want to ask you another question. You know, you had, you had talked about the word critical mass earlier. And when we think about today, like, have we hit critical mass yet? This episode of Burn Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you supported through Patreon and with partnerships brought to you by the following. If you've listened to the show before, you know that Ryan has his own business and sees perks like financial freedom, being his own boss, and having more control of his time. And you want to do that too, but maybe you're just not sure where to start. All this can be yours when you open a UPS Store franchise. The UPS Store has over 35 years of franchising experience and was just ranked the number four top franchise to own by Entrepreneur Magazine's 2017 Franchise 500 list. The UPS Store offers stability, the support and reputation of a world-renowned brand, and a proven business model with all the training and marketing support you need to make your entrepreneurial dream come true. Stores are available in large and small markets across the country, and their franchising experts will help you find a location that's just right for you. Plus, there's financing for those who qualify and special programs for military veterans. The time to promote yourself to business owner is now. Visit the upsstorefranchising.com slash bourbon to get started today. That's the upsstorefranchising.com slash bourbon. Art Eatables, the world's first bourbon certified chocolatier, is your best source for bourbon inspired candy and chocolate creations. Their small batch bourbon truffle is found throughout the bourbon trail, featuring over 70 different bourbons and ryes. They make chocolates for more distillers than everyone else in the state combined. Each bourbon truffle is adorned with a chocolate token, their trademark BIT, or the BIT, that identifies the bourbon and marks it as a genuine Art Eatables creation. If you're looking to try a bourbon and chocolate pairing, this is the creme de la creme. In addition to their famous bourbon truffles that come in 4, 8, 16 packs, and various sampler collections, check out their other creations such as caramels, dipped Oreos, and hand-painted chocolates. Shop their downtown Louisville locations at 631 South 4th Street and 819 West Main Street, or have them shipped to your door when the online store reopens this fall at arteatables.com. Use offer code PURSUIT to save 5% on your in-store and online orders. But I, I kind of want to ask you another question. You know, you had, you had talked about the word critical mass earlier. And when we think about today, like, have we hit critical mass yet? I mean, because my opinion, I still see us kind of still driving up the hockey stick at this point. Well, the certainly the distilleries are not going to let any grass grow under their feet. They are expanding. Uh, new distilleries are going online. It was just announced yesterday that Bardstown Bourbon Company, which has only been operating for a little over a year, is going to expand over the next year up to a, a six million, uh, uh, you know, six million gallon 
a proof gallon production uh, level, which is, they say makes them one of the biggest, eh, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it makes them maybe number six, which is certainly, uh, certainly pretty substantial for a company that's only been in operation for a little more than a year. So there's a lot of people still building, I mean, uh, Luxco Distillery, also in Bardstown, um, will probably start producing by, you know, toward the end of this year. Uh, you yeah, know, so we, we, you don't think we've actually hit it yet then? Hmm? So you don't think we've hit the critical mass well, yet? I, I mean, they don't. I, I don't think anyone really knows. I think that's the big gamble right now. A lot of people very sort of reflexively every time this news of somebody new expansion comes out or a new distillery comes out, everybody says, oh, you know, we're going to have a glut in five or six years. You know, some people just, you know, some people are just naysayers. I mean, you certainly have people in the enthusiast community who are predicting that, but certainly nobody in the industry is. Everybody in the industry, I haven't heard anybody in the industry say, hey, we need to cut back. We need to slow this thing down. We need, you know, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves or anything like that. And, and what it really amounts to is export growth. I mean, yes, the domestic market right now is pretty saturated. It's hard to imagine how much more bourbon Americans can drink. Um, they can drink, still drink more, but, um, you know, not in double-digit growth types of numbers. But, you so, know, there are a lot. Of, so it's really, it's really export, and, it, and it's ultimately going to depend on China and India. If those markets open up and expand like they could, just considering the population that they have and considering the, the, the drinking habits that they already have. Um, you know, so those mark when we think about China and India, off, sorry, I mean, when we think about China and India right there, the, the question I'm going to throw at you, like, what do you think could be the potential downfall of right now? What we've seen with the, uh, the steel tariffs, uh, the talk of Trump and then possibly the, the, the import taxes that are going to be put on Kentucky whiskey because, you know, they kind of want to kick, you know, McConnell on the balls and stuff like that. So like, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? We're looking at a much longer frame than, than that in, in talking about these things because growth, import, export growth, value of, of the exports has been growing at, at 10, 11, 12% a year for the last several years, including this last year. And it's not even to places to China and India. It's to still, you know, still tremendous growth going on in Western Europe, uh, really throughout Europe. Um, things are starting to grow. Brazil is becoming a significant market. Panama is becoming a significant market. I mean, you see some of these uh, places like Panama that grew 75% last year. Now, Panama is not a big country and it's, it's growing from a, a very small base, but um, you know, right now the exports are growing very strongly and China and India really aren't even in the picture yet. You know, that's still many years out. So yes, those are uh, the kind of things that could throw roadblocks in the way. China has been on this, um, I forget exactly, anti-luxury kind of kick for the last couple of years, uh, really trying to, to keep the, uh, especially the, the government officials and so forth from spending a lot of money, uh, it has been cognac uh, up to this point that they've been spending a lot of money on buying expensive cognacs and the government's tried to put a clamp on that and it has hurt the cognac business because the cognac business was growing very strong in, in China and it, it, it's been a setback. So there's there are bound to be bumps in the road and the bumps don't necessarily mean we won't eventually get there. And the, the saying I always say is that if if the, the, those markets do grow, then nobody will have made enough. Even with as much as people are making now, it won't be enough. But if those markets don't grow and if there are more uh, bumps in the road than we can deal with, um, everybody will have been made too much. So it's certainly possible. It's certainly well, possible. We're I'll gonna... throw another bump in the road for you and kind of kind of gauge your opinion on this. So do you think we could possibly see people drop off? You know, people that have gotten into this and say the, the recent five sure. years, we'll say sure. five yeah. years. Awesome. You think, well, you think we could see a drop off of people because, you know, right now, maybe there's not enough well-aged whiskey uh, 
uh, that we had, you know, had mentioned earlier is that there's an unintended consequences of the, the, the glut that we had earlier. And now we've got, you know, distillers and craft distillers. And should I say the craft distillers are still very young. The key, uh, key big distillers out there removing age statements now. So how's that going to affect the future of the bourbon industry? You know, could we see people start dropping off because of it's a that? risk. I mean, it's a definite risk. Um, and it's something that really has happened before. It was part of what they were worried about when they couldn't meet demand in the 60s. And it may have actually played a role in the collapse of the market, that people uh, couldn't get the whiskey they wanted. And so they went looking for alternatives. They, find, they found alternatives and never went back. And that is absolutely a risk uh, that, that uh, uh, people who like very well-aged whiskey and are not finding it and not finding it at the prices they like, they might switch to, uh, well, they, they might switch to scotch. They might switch to uh, Isla scotches and things like that, except they're in the same kind of boat. They're not exactly in, in uh, great supply or, and certainly are not at cheap prices, but uh, you never know. I mean, somebody might, uh, uh, you know, tequila kind of came out of nowhere when it became popular. Uh, you know, you never know what, what somebody's going to, and that's the big, that's the big thing that scares. That's the big thing that keeps um, people with a lot of money invested in this industry awake at night, uh, worrying about the next new thing that isn't a bourbon, you know, and you never know what it's going to be. Um, mm -hmm. Probably going to be an intoxicant of some kind, but that's why they're paying very, very close attention to legal marijuana. Um, now, my comment on that has always been, do you know anybody who smokes pot who doesn't drink? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know? But, uh, you know, so I'm not, I'm not real worried about that because, but, uh, but that is the kind of thing that people look at very carefully um, and, and very closely. And they want to see how those trends, how those trends are going. And do you think craft distillers could ever put a dent in this market where they could fill a gap that the big boys can't take care of, or they're just they're just trying to get their piece of the pie, and that's all there is? Who's a craft? You know, who's a craft distiller? Is Bardstown Bourbon Company a craft distiller at six million uh, proof gallons? You know, again, it's sort of hard to define. They're a brand new distiller. They're a new company that has you know sort of come out of nowhere. They've got a very experienced master distiller in Steve Nally, but they are a, a new company and they did kind of come up out of this craft uh, thing. So we've really got this um, this category of, of, of companies that kind of came out of the craft movement, but their the distilleries are too big to be really what I would consider craft. What, what the small distilleries are doing, they're not going to make ever make a big dent in, in volume just by definition. If they're small and they're not producing very much, they're not going to, even if there are thousands of them, they're not going to make much of a dent in volume. Uh, they really mostly, what their result has been, has been very positive for the, uh, for the, the major producers because they get people interested in the category. They get people curious about different styles of things. And that's where the craft distilleries really make their contribution is exposing people to different flavors, different ways of making uh, bourbon, different ways of delivering it. And, uh, and of course the craft cocktail movement has also played a real big role in that because they're showing people different ways to use both the mainstream products and the craft products and, and creating drinks that are um, enjoyable, that are pleasant, that people enjoy drinking. Um, and if you drink something, you, know, you go to a bar and you drink a, a cocktail and, and it's something that really appeals to you, you're going to figure out how to make it at home, you know, and, and buy those ingredients and so forth. So yeah, all those trends do, uh, feed on each other and, and, and support each other. I just finished a piece um, about how when the craft distilling movement started, a lot of the craft distillers were very critical of, of the big guys and, and, and accused them of trying to stamp out the craft distillers. It was never really the case. In fact, you don't hear that that much anymore because 
they've seen that it's not the case. In fact, the relationship is very symbiotic. Um, and they want to get bought up sometimes too, right? Well, and that's then the other thing. Yeah, a lot of these people, um, now a lot of them have, have not really been, you say craft distiller and yet that, that term kind of implies distiller. <laughs> and a lot of the places that have these, these names that sound like distilleries either haven't been distilling at all or they have been not really selling their home distilled product as much as they've been selling a source product. So yeah, there's been a certain, a certain confusion, a certain muddiness in the market, but these are all factors, you know, if, if, and if people are buying whiskey and drinking whiskey, then it's all to the good, right? Absolutely. So I kind of want to wrap up with, uh, with two more questions here. Um, so one, uh, somebody had asked and they said, you know, I want to get your honest take on the future of bourbon. And if you think the bubble will pop, because right now we've got bottles that are unicorn bottles and, you know, there's crazy prices that are being asked for them. Um, you know, there's the, the secondary market where people are flipping bottles all the time, you know, and not only that is like the bottles that were costing us say you know old force of birthdays a recent release you know that was that was a fifty dollar bottle three or four years ago now it's a ninety dollar bottle of retail you know when is this bot when is this bubble gonna burst or do you think it will at all well i think i think it will continue to change i don't think you're going to see anything like what happened at the end of the 60s where the bottom just fell out. I don't think we're going to see that again. But I think as things ebb and flow, we may have periods where, um, you know, things are very tight for six months, and then things loosen up for six months or 18 months or whatever it might be. I mean, I, I don't think we're ever going to see, um, you know, vast supplies of unicorn type bottles because they wouldn't be unicorns then if they were easy to get and inexpensive they wouldn't be unicorns uh so so that's part of the market now that idea of of these products that are uh, very scarce very expensive you've got this secondary market um that people both love and complain about i think the the biggest problem with the secondary market is that it's all illegal and so it has to be done it's not super illegal, but, uh, you know, there aren't people being arrested left and right for it or anything, but it is still illegal. So it has to be done underground. Anything that's, that's on the down low like that has a tendency to attract people who are up to no good. So there's a lot of, um, you know, that's where the counterfeits are. That's where the, the scams are. And the best way to solve those problems would be to legalize it. Uh, Kentucky has sort of made an attempt to do that. Uh, there are some other places where um, where vintage spirits can be bought and sold legally, but it's not really been normalized yet. And that, I, I think if 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 government, if legislators, if the industry and the, the legislators could figure out uh, an intelligent way to do that, I think that would help a lot. And where would be a better place to do it than Kentucky? where you already have a government, maybe not the current government, but government in general, and certainly a legislature that is um, recognizes the benefits of, of whiskey and whiskey sales and whiskey production, um, and, and has made a, an attempt to, to legalize the secondary market. So I think that would go a long way toward um, normalizing, yeah. Yeah. normalizing that. But unicorns, wouldn't be unicorns if they weren't expensive and hard to get. Right. So you think those prices are always going to stay or continually increase, or you think the the they might? I think it. I think it'll have a legal way to where they can go actually to auction where somebody says this bottle is worth twenty five hundred, but actually it's only worth maybe seventeen hundred, right? Like I said, I think if things were more open and people could get involved in a more open and honest way, where they could go to an auction and, and trust that the products being sold are authentic and that the, um, you know, and be able to do it in the open and just, just the whole ability to uh, have, you know, to anybody to assess what something is worth, you've got to know what people are paying for that, that something. And when you've got a market that's on the down low, you don't get that. You don't know what 
what real prices are because uh, people have an incentive to distort the market. So even if you try to get information, nothing's on the record. So people can lie about what they're paying. People can lie about uh, what they're offering, uh, what they're willing to pay, everything else, anything that they think is to their advantage. Um, you know, that's why markets exist. And that's why markets are regulated so that people can buy and sell with, with confidence. And we don't have that in the in the whiskey secondary market right now. And that would, if we had that, that would go a long way to making it, making it more normal. And uh, yeah, you wouldn't have people who, who just have more money than sense spending $3,000 for a bottle of Pappy when in a normal open market exchange that it's going for a thousand or 900 or something like that. So, you know, you're not going to pay 3000, even the, the stupidest person's not going to pay right. 3000 if there's an easy way for them to get the same thing for a lot less. No, I got you. So the last question I want to throw your way, and this isn't necessarily about the unicorns or the high end release or anything like that, but you know, what's the what's the key to making this trend last where people are gonna continually be interested in bourbon? I think keeping it fresh, keeping it new, that's it, always been something that's been hard for bourbon because new is not new and improved is not a word you want you know, on your bourbon. Um but people do. I mean, consumers are consumers, and they, they want the new things and the latest things. And, and people who've actually figured out a way to do that um, and do that intelligently. Uh, so you get, you know, and, and some of it's hit or miss. Some of it works, some of it doesn't. But look at Angel's Envy. I mean, Angel's Envy, very simple idea, which is you take a fairly ordinary bourbon, you finish it in port casks, and port is a, a, a very compatible flavor with with bourbon. Um, and wow, you've got something that's a little bit different, uh, that tastes really good, that's a premium price as far as being a very profitable product, but not out of reach for the consumer, and it's in the stores, and it's readily available. And, uh, and so a lot of people are, are following that trend, doing, doing, uh, doing various, uh, secondary wood finishes. Um, you know, so, so there are ways to, to keep, keep the thing fresh uh, these limited editions that people do. I mean, you know, four roses, uh, is able to, to always come out with different things because they've got the four rest or the 10 recipes and, uh, you know, the two bash bills and the five yeasts that allow them to do pretty much an unlimited, um, number of different different products. They're not hugely different, but they're different enough to to make some news and get people interested. Well, that's been the trend um, that's going on now and has been going on for the last couple of years is just as much new product, anything that you can come out with that's a line extension, that's a brand extension, that's a little bit of a different twist on the product. I mean, Jim Beam as a company, not just with the Jim Beam brand, but with um, just yesterday, I, I tasted a, a product that, that they're coming out with called uh, Basil Hayden Dark Rye. And it's actually a blend of bourbon, Canadian whiskey, and port wine. They're just under going the, crazy on you that one, right? Under the under the Basil Hayden brand name, still eighty proof, which is kind of the Basil Hayden signature, is that lower proof. Um, but again, you know, well aged, well aged whiskey, and and port is a very compatible flavor, and so it, it's good. But the main thing is, is that it's new. It's 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 some something new to talk about something new to try, something new to have at your, at your bourbon club you know, meeting. And that's what people like. And that's been really the, the, the key to success uh, across the board. I mean, that's why the craft distilleries are doing well. Craft distilleries also have, um, you know, a, a great tourism type of, of angle and the major distilleries do too. But you know, as popular, as much as people love their cars, who wants to go see where their car is made? I mean, there's some of that. 
<laughs> that's true. Widespread. Um, and you certainly, you know, who wants to go see where their favorite breakfast cereal is made? You know, nobody. But people want to see where their favorite bourbon is made. And, you know, Jack Daniels still gets a quarter of a million visitors a year to the, and, and, and Lynchburg is not on the way to anywhere. Anybody who's going to Jack Daniels is not going there because they're in the neighborhood for something else. They're going there to go to Jack Daniels, and, and it's a quarter of a million people a year who, who do that. Yeah. And the, the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, um, people who actually officially you know, use the passport and sort of sign up for the trail, those numbers are, are well over a half a million people a year. Uh, Buffalo Trace, all by itself, not being part of the official trail, um, gets, I, I'm not sure what the number is now, but it's a couple hundred a year. Uh, yeah. So, you know, all of those things, uh, yeah, I think everybody has recognized that bourbon's a unique product. It's uniquely American. Uh, it's unique uh, among distilled spirits products. It's unique among consumer products in general in that people develop an attachment to a brand or a product that they just don't with other, even other alcohols. I mean, you get, you, you, you see it, you know, certainly there are, there are wine enthusiasts, there are beer enthusiasts. So it is all sort of part of a, a, of a piece um, with, clothing or, or uh, food yeah, or other consumables and stuff like that. Of consumables. It's, it's, it's kind of unique in that regard. And I think everybody has recognized it and figured out ways to, to exploit it and keep it moving forward. So I think things are generally positive and I don't really see, uh, yeah, there's always going to be bumps in the road. There are always going to be, I don't think we're going to see the bubble burst in the same sense that the tech bubble uh, burst some years back, uh, but I think we'll see little little bursts um, every now little, and then. Small little, bubbles will pop, but little, nothing huge. Little things that pop and change, and 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 some people may may get hurt in, in the process. Somebody who's maybe over invested in X won't be ready when Y comes along, but um, but other people will and. Uh, so I think it's going to, I certainly think it's going to continue to be very interesting. I don't think you're going to get bored. I don't think I'm going to get bored. I think that uh, just when I think I'm getting bored, something new happens that gets me excited again. So uh, I think I'm going to be able to, I think I'm going to be able to ride this train to the end. Well, good. That means there's, there's more books to write. There's more podcasts to put out. This is, this is not going to be over yet. So Chuck, I want to say thanks again for coming on the show, man. And there's more whiskey to drink. And there's going to be more whiskey to drink, that's for sure. <laughs> so, Chuck, uh, again, thank you for coming on the show today. It was great to get you know a lot of your input and your insight. And I think we're going to have to have you on again. Now that we figured out how to use Google Hangouts, <laughs> you're, gonna, you're going to be on. You're going to be on here. I'm going to I'm going to put you on a rotation like every ten episodes or something like that. So and I don't uh, want to get me on again, so I don't forget everything I learned this time. <laughs> sounds good so chuck thank you again for anybody that wants to get in touch with chuck you can find him on his blog you can go to amazon you can search for his books you can go to uh you can actually buy his books on his blog you can buy that ket special that's still on dvd he said he still has a few more copies left and then uh then we i'm going to try to help him figure out how to get it on youtube so we'll we'll figure out how to do that too at some point we'll do all right. So thank you again, Chuck. Make sure you follow Thanks, us Jerry. on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Bourbon Pursuit. Support the show on Patreon, patreon.com slash Bourbon Pursuit. If you have any other show suggestions, people you'd like to see or want to just send us some fan mail, go ahead. You can send us an email at the duo, T-H-E-D-U-O at BourbonPursuit.com. Uh, once again, Chuck, thank you, and we will see you all next week. 